恭听大德神听，为智发挥记忆，皆众生，请转妙法论教导我们，如何了生，脱失离苦得乐。殊正无上。Will the Sangha with great virtue, out of compassion for the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to live suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death? And quickly realize non-birth. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Sadanto Sucheto Ye Alahati San Miao San Puto Che. 无上深深微妙法，百千万劫难遭遇。我今见闻得受持，愿解如来真实意。Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in a billion eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Remember, Master uh, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Remember, Master, and all good knowing advisors. Welcome back to class number eighty-nine on the Medicine Master Buddha Sutra. Today we have uh, the Tushita Heaven,、uh, which is a very how you say significant、um, heaven. Because if your Dharma door is not the pure land,、uh, then this should be the the alternate Dharma door, and we're going to explore why. Uh, but before we get there, let's recite Medicine Master Buddha's name seven times. Namo quelling disasters, lending life, Medicine Master Buddha. Namo quelling disasters, lending life. Medicine Master Buddha Namo, 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 quelling disasters, lending life. Medicine Master Buddha, Medicine Master, does come one. Medicine Master does come one. Medicine Master does come one. Medicine Master does come one. Okay, let me get slides for today, and、um, as I mentioned. Just now,、um, today we are going to the Tushita Heaven. Let me show you where the Tushita Heaven is. 
Okay, so if you look at your screen, uh, if you look at number 6 to 11, we have gone through number 6, which is heaven of the four kings, and number 5, which is the heaven of the 33, or the triumph trim share heaven. And then uh, today we are, uh, and then last week, we gone through number 7, uh, sorry, 6, 7, 8, my counting is wrong. 8 is to Yama heaven, and then now we are number 9, which is uh, the Tushita heaven. So we have two more heavens to go after the Tushita heaven in uh, what is known as the six heavens of the desire realm or the six desire heavens. All right. Uh, okay. So Tushita heaven uh, is a very significant heaven. It's slightly special from all the rest of the other six uh, desire heavens. Um, in the sense that if you have a goal in Buddhist practice, let's say you are kind of, uh, you're no longer a beginner. Beginner means you don't really have a goal in Buddhism. You just maybe do certain things because you know it's good to do. And you hope for the best for your, when, when, it, when the time comes for you to die, you, you just hope for the best. Okay. But if you are a bit more advanced than that, and you have a goal, you have wows and you have intentions and you know about the pure land, but somehow or other you feel like the pure land is not your Dharma door. Okay. Um, for whatever reason you, you feel, you just don't feel like you connect to the pure land. Well, then, um, more or less the only real alternative that you have is the Tushita heaven as a backup. All right. And why? Okay. You're going to have to stick around to find out why. Okay. Let's explore the Tushita heaven. Okay. Uh, so this is the fourth highest of the six heavens within the desire realm. And, um, now we're going to find out. Okay. Spoiler. Is why is it of particular importance? Well, because future Buddhas are born here before taking their final birth in the human world and attaining Buddhahood. So it was from this heaven that a particular god named Seta Ketu, or Swet, yeah, Sweta Ketu, who was going to be Shakyamuni Buddha, from this heaven, he came down to Jambuvipa, which is uh, our earth continent. The, uh, Jambuvipa is a continent where our earth, uh, where we are located, we human beings are located right now. And he was born here with his, uh, and he chose his mother, uh, he chose his mother, which was Lady Maya. And that's how he became, uh, the Buddha. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll see why Tushita heaven should be one of our, uh, uh, aims to get to, uh, if we are not aiming to go to the pure land. All right. Tushita means satisfaction and contentment. Why? Well, because over here, you're always happy. You're, you're even more happy than the previous heaven, which was the Suyam, Suyam heaven. Uh, here, your pleasure is at a more refined state. You're always satisfied and content all the time. Shufu says, from, this is from the Ten Dharma realm. Shufu says, those who know contentment are always happy. Since they are cheerful and content all the time, they don't have any afflictions or worries. And then a single day and night here is e equivalent to 400,000 human years. Can you imagine that? Okay. So one day and one night here is e equivalent to 400. Uh, no, sorry. I, I didn't say that right. It's not 400,000. It's 400 human years. Okay. I knew something was wrong. So one day and one night in this heaven is equivalent to 400 human years. And the gods here have a lifespan of 4,000 heavenly years. Okay. Now that's right. Yeah. So if you're a god here, you know, you take a nap, um, by the time you wake up from your nap, uh, any human, you know, would probably have, uh, passed away by that time. That's how time travels, uh, in this heaven. So in the Shurangama Sutra, in, uh, the Buddha says, uh, the Buddha is explaining how you get to be born here in terms of desire. The Buddha says some others are always still, meaning the mind uh, and thoughts of desire. It says always still. 
except when they are unable to resist the stimulus of contact. After their lives have ended, they ascend to a refined place that is isolated from the lower heavens and from the human realm. What does the lower heavens mean? It means the heaven of the four kings and the heaven of the 33. And then the Buddha says, uh, such people become gods of the heaven of joyous contentment. Joyous contentment is another way uh, Tushita is uh, called sometimes. And Shofu, in his commentary, he explains that this means when uh, always still means that at all times in all situations, they never move. That means their minds are always, uh, you could say like almost like in Samadhi. They're not thinking about desire all the time. Shufu says they're very tranquil. However, when an occasion arises for sexual intercourse, it's not for certain that they will not get involved. But they won't, excuse me, they don't really want to get involved. So it, it's not something that they really want. Uh, but for example, if they're married and their spouse uh, wants it, then they, they neither do they, how you say, deny it. They may occasionally indulge in this activity, but very, very rarely. At death, these people who have few desires and are content will ascend to a subtle and lateral place and will not fall down. So who are people like this? Well, um, lay people who are uh, first stage arhats, for example, from the first to the third stage arhat. But usually the first stage arhat, um, because why? Uh, normally, lay people who have achieved uh, second or third stage arhats uh, usually become monks or nuns. Those who are third stage arhats definitely become left home people. Uh, so it's usually people in the first stage uh, uh, arhat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me go on. Furthermore, in this sutra, the Buddha says that the destruction of the realms of humans and gods by the three great disasters that will come at the end of the eon or end of the kalpa will not reach them. So Shufu explains that in this heaven, there's an inner and an outer court. So there's two parts to the Tushita heaven. In the outer court, the normal or the common gods dwell, and the inner court, sages dwell. What's the difference? Well, uh, the inner court is where uh, it's not just through blessings, but through cultivation of the mind, and you get to the inner God. But if all you have is just uh, blessings, then you are born in the outer God. And uh, I have some uh, uh, stories that uh, to 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 illustrate that. And then, so as a result of that, the three disasters that will happen at the end of the Kalpa that is going to wipe out the earth, the the world that we know of, and then um, are the disasters of fire, the disasters of water, and the disasters of wind. So what happened, uh, according to Shufu, um, okay, I'll come to the next uh, slide, and then I'll, Shufu will explain. Shufu says, fire burns through the first dhyana, water drowns the second dhyana, and wind devastates the third dhyana. This is in reference to the higher heavens. So it's not just this heaven at this uh, level, but the higher heavens, uh, the first Dhyana heaven where Lord Brahma is, fire will destroy it. And then the second Dhyana heaven, which is higher up, water will destroy it. And then finally, the third Dhyana heavens will be destroyed by wind. And then the heavens of the fourth Dhyana will escape. So Shufu says, why? So Tushita is special in the sense that Shufu says, because bodhisattvas reside in the inner court of the Tushita heaven, the three disasters cannot reach it. So because there are sages there, the Tushita heaven alone uh, is protected, except for the very high heaven, which is the heaven of the fourth dhyana. And Shufu says, they simply don't have, um, Tushita means having few desires and being content. They simply don't have any greed. They are devoid of sexual desire. So if you want to get reborn in the heavens, have just have few desires and be content. Okay. Shufu goes on to say, to have strong emotions and to be forever uh, thinking of that kind of thing, never being able to put it down for even an instant though, that's very dangerous. It is in fact the most uh, perilous matter of all. It's the source of one's fall. If you don't fear the fall, then think about that kind of stuff as much as you want, which is which are thoughts of desire. If you're afraid of falling, then quickly stop these emotional thoughts. If you don't stop, there's no telling well that you'll, you'll end up 
in the future. Okay. So who gets reborn in the Tushita heaven? Well, uh, let's look at the inner card. This is Petrarch Quechi's commentary on the Heart Sutra. Uh, who is Petrarch, uh, Petrarch Quechi? Uh, he's also known, if I'm not wrong, okay, he's also known as a three card Petrarch. He was the meditator that um, when Elder Master Xuanzang was on his way to India to bring back the sutras to China, and he found this meditator who was living in a cave and he was in Samadhi, and he was in Samadhi for so long that a thick layer of dust had built up in his body, and Shufu said that the birds uh, were making nests in his hair. And so Xuanzang uh, rang a handbell to bring the um the meditator out of samadhi and then Xuan Chang asked this meditator he said what are you doing here he said oh i'm waiting for the buddha to come into the world and i'm going to help him propagate the dharma and then uh, master Xuan Chang said oh the buddha has come and gone uh, and i don't remember the dates but he said it's been a few hundred years at least or maybe a thousand years and then the meditator, meditator said, oh, it, really? Okay, I'll just go back into Samadhi and wait for the next Buddha to come. And uh, uh, Rambo Swan Chang said, no, 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 why don't you go get reborn uh, and uh, help me propagate the Dharma. And he gave him instructions to get reborn. So it's a longer story. Uh, he got reborn in the wrong house and then uh, he was forced to leave home. And he said, okay, if I have to leave, if since I'm forced to leave home, which I don't want to do, but since I'm being forced by the emperor, then everywhere I go, I want three cuts to follow me, a, one cut full of wine, one cut full of meat, and one cut full of women. And uh, that's why he's called the three cut Petra. So his commentary on the Heart Sutra, he says, abiding in advanced knowledge corresponding to truths. This is the fifth Bhumi. So he's referring to the fifth ground of uh, Bodhisattvas. There are 10 Bodhisattva stages. Uh, he's referring to the fifth ground. He said, after having achieved the 10 joyful and pure thoughts of equanimity, the Bodhisattva enters this stage and contemplates all truths with 10 skillful means. He correctly refutes all erroneous practices and has compassion for sentient beings. <clears throat> He gathers the provisions of blessings and wisdom, cultivates proper vows, and practices insightful thought which increases virtue and eradicates deviant thoughts. He employs all kinds of skillful means to bring sentient beings to maturity, such as the arts, to inspire them to virtue. So he might be an artist, he might use uh, song, music, or other things that people like uh, to, as, a, as a way to bring them to the Dharma. So he often becomes a divine king in the Toshita heaven who teaches beings to forsake all internal and external deviant dharmas. So a fifth stage bodhisattva is reborn often as a king in the Toshita heaven. And this usually means that is, uh, this is in the inner god, not the outer god. Okay. All right. Now I have a story um, of someone who I don't know when this happened. Uh, but basically, it comes from one of the commentaries and it says a certain righteous lay disciple together with his entire family was much, much given to the distribution of alms. At last, he grew ill and lay on his deathbed and he requested that 8 or 16 bhikkhus come to recite for him. So this is someone who has spent a long time um, uh, giving food to, to monastics and not just food, the requisites as well, uh, food. Um, medicine, shelter, and uh, bedding, clothing. Wait, let me see. Food, clothes, no, food, clothing, medicine, shelter. These four things, the four requisites. So the bhikkhus came and they were chanting the Satipata, uh, Satipatthana Sutta. That's a very famous sutra that talks about uh, contemplation of the body. Um, I'll just give a quick uh, introduction to the sutra it why because uh, you know anyone who's interested in reborn in the Tushita heaven might want to explore uh, this sutra so basically this what does this sutra cover uh, is is a fairly advanced sutra it covers there's a section of breathing 
uh, how to be mindful of your breath and then how to be mindful of your uh, modes of deportment meaning as you're sitting standing walking and lying down and then it talks about uh, uh, clear comprehension um, as you are walking forwards and backwards as you are using your eyes and and looking as you're using your body as you're wearing your clothes as you're eating and you're drinking as you're washing the body now all these things during your daily life how can you develop very clear uh, uh, awareness of what's going on all the time and then understanding the proper nature of the body like what's in the body what makes up the body we take the body for granted all we see is our skin and you know the outside but um, this sutra teaches us to contemplate what's inside so we see the body for what it is and then uh, it goes on uh, yeah, it, the, this part of the sutra talks about, is basically aimed at uh, helping us relinquish our attachments uh, to the body and then it teaches us how the Buddha teaches us how to contemplate our feelings our consciousness and our the thoughts in our mind and uh, how to break through them uh, and and so on yeah there are, it talks about the five skandhas and and how to basically how to be a sage if you want to be a first stage uh, arhat a stream enterer uh, this is a very good sutra to explore okay so the monks were reciting this sutra at uh, next to this person and he was about to die okay uh, it's kind of like how when we our practice here is we recite the buddha's name so there they were reciting the satipatthana sutta so while they were reciting this uh, dying man saw six chariots arrive from the six different deva worlds meaning he saw six chariots from each of the six desire heavens from the heaven of the four kings is the from the triumphal heaven or the heaven of the 33 from the suyam uh, heaven one from the tushita heaven uh, one from the heaven above the tushita heaven which is called the nirma narati uh, heaven or the heaven of bliss by transformation and then the next heaven up the heaven of uh, transformation over others uh, heaven uh, all each one sent this man a chariot and the chariots were extremely uh, huge and they were drawn by a thousand horses meaning they were all very uh, elaborate and each chariot had gods following it and all of them uh, were calling out to this uh, dying man said you know let us take you to our deva loka deva loka means heavenly realm it says look your vessel of clay is broken meaning his body is going to is, is broken is giving up it says take a vessel of gold arise into our deva loka to experience bliss so how about that we have stories about how people who want to be reborn in the pure land they get greeted by um, amitabha buddha or guanin pusat uh, and great strength bodhisattva or all three of them uh, well this person is greeted by the gods of the six desire realms the uh, heavens so the lay disciple not wanting to interrupt the Dhamma recitation, he knew what was more important. He, he cried out, wait, wait. He was asking the gods to wait. But the bhikkhus who were reciting, they didn't, they couldn't see um, the, the gods. So they thought that, oh, he's asking them to stop. So they got up from their seats and left. So he had some daughters around him and the daughters asked him why he had told the monks to stop their recitation. And then he explained, he said, I wasn't speaking to the monks, but I was speaking to the gods. He says there are six um, heavenly chariots suspended in the air above me and all of them are calling to me to go to their world. So the daughters all looked up, but they couldn't see anything because only he could see the, uh, uh, the chariots, the heavenly chariots. So he asked his daughter or his daughters, he says, uh, which is the most delightful deva world so he could see six of them and he is uh how you say he wants to know which is the best world to choose from so the the daughter 
replied, he says, Dear Father, the Toshita world is the most delightful. Okay, technically that's not true. Technically, the two heavens above are, are better in terms of pleasure and, 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 and refinement and contentment. But, he says, the Bodhisattvas and the Buddha's mother and father dwell in Toshita. He says, all the Bodhisattvas, yeah. And then the father then told her, okay, take a flower garland and throw it into the air saying, let this garland adhere to the chariot from Tushita. So he takes his daughter's advice and he chooses the Tushita heaven. Okay. So what did she do? She threw the wreath, wreath of flowers uh, into the air and then it didn't fall down. It got suspended because the wreath uh, chose the chariot from the Tushita heaven and hung on one of the, the, the poles of, on, that was present on the, on the, on the chariot. And so everyone only saw that, that a wreath of flowers just hanging in the air. And then the lay disciple the, who was dying explained to them, the man explained to them that, oh, it's hanging on the chariot pole and said that if you think of me and wish to be reborn near me, please do acts of merit like I did. So he's encouraging them. So after saying that he died and he went into the chariot and immediately he was reborn uh, on the spot in the form of the Tushita God. He said that he was decorated with 60 cut loads of adornments, that means treasures, attended by a thousand acharas. If you remember acharas from a different, from a past uh, class, those are like your heavenly maidens or attendants. And then he had a golden vimana, which is a palace, 25 yojanas in size, which appeared uh, for him. So the source here is uh, from the uh, Dhammapada uh, 1.11, if anyone is interested from the uh, commentary of the Dhammapada. So that's one way to get reborn in the Tushita heaven. And um, so this would most likely be the outer court, not the inner court, okay, would be the outer court. Okay, now we go to the Lotus Sutra, all right. Chapter 28 from the Lotus Sutra, and this is titled The Exhortation of Samantha Bhadra or Great Strength Bodhisattva. So Great Strength Bodhisattva says that if a person merely writes out the sutra, meaning the Lotus Sutra, so all you have to do is just write it out, okay? At the end of his life, he will be born in a Triyan Trimsha heaven. This is the heaven of 33. At that time, 84,000 heavenly women will welcome him with all kinds of music. He shall immediately don a cap made of seven treasures and enjoy himself among the goddesses. So according to Great Strength Bodhisattva, if you try out the sutra, this is what happens. Then he, uh, Great Strength Bodhisattva says, he says, how much the more will this be the case for one who receives, upholds, reads and recites it, properly recollects it, explains his, his doctrines and cultivates according to his teachings. So he says, okay, if you just write it out and you get to be reborn in the heaven of the 33 or the triumphant heaven, says, imagine if, okay, you receive. Receive means you, you, um, you, it's more than just accept. It's, uh, how you say, uh, hmm, let me see what's a better word. Um, You, yeah, you, you accept it, but not like a physical acceptance. It, you, I, I, I guess the rest of the words, uh, provide context for what kind of acceptance, meaning you, 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 you read, but not just a, like a cursory reading, you investigate, you are able to recite, you are able to recollect. That means it enters your memory. You're able to explain, which means you understand the principles. And not only that, you practice according to his teachings. So th when you receive a sutra like that, that's, uh, is in that sense, you, uh, you really investigate the principles of the sutra. You memorize the sutra. You are, you are able to expound the myriad principles within the sutra into different specifics or applications uh, of different conditions. 
and you practice what you preach. You you, you actually uh, practice according to the sutra as well. Okay. So what happens when you do that? All right. Great time Bodhisattva says, if you receive, you uphold, you read, you recite, explain its doctrines or the meanings, at the end of your life, a thousand Buddhas, okay, a thousand Buddhas will extend their hands towards you so that you need not fear falling into the evil destinies. He will be immediately be born in the Tushita heaven in the presence of Maitreya Bodhisattva. So this is going to be the inner court. Maitreya Bodhisattva has 32 monks and is surrounded by a host of great Bodhisattvas and a retinue of hundreds of thousands of myriads of kotis of goddesses. Being born therein, he shall obtain merit and virtue and benefits such as this. So who is going to accompany you there? Well, uh, according to Pet Petra Koichi, it will be, uh, you will find your Dharma brothers would be Bodhisattvas of the faith ground, for example. Uh, so this is another way to get into the inner court of the Tushita heaven. Okay, so we, we've explored how to get to the Tushita heaven. All right, let's see who uh, else, uh, how you say, uh, managed to get born in the Tushita heaven. All right, one of which is Anatta Pindika who was uh, famous. He is the one who purchased the Jetta Grove by covering the whole entire grove with gold coins from uh, Prince Jetta. And he managed to buy it and offer it to the Buddha. And if you remember a story I told many classes ago, um, he, he was very rich and then he lost his treasure. And then a spirit that was living in his house who was kicked up, um, was given the task by Lord Chakra to recover his treasure as a way to make amends for the spirit's mistake. So this is Ana, uh, Anatta Pindika, who is also known as the Buddha's chief patron of all the Buddha's lay disciples. Uh, he was known as the one most supportive. Okay, so this sutra, uh, which is from the, um, uh, if I look it up, is SN 55.27. Samyutta uh, Nikaya collection is when Ana, Anatta Pindika was nearing his own death. He was going to die. So it begins like, not begins, it, it, this part of the sutra begins this way. It says, Marabha Ananda uh, wore his robes in the morning and taking his bowl and rope, went to the home of the householder, householder Anatta Pindika. He sat down on the seat, spread out and said to Anatta Pindika, I hope you're keeping well, householder. I hope you're all right. And I hope the pain is fading, not growing. That is fading, not is growing, is apparent. So Anatta Pindika says, Sir, I'm not keeping well. I'm not all right. The pain is terrible and growing is not fading. Is growing is evident, not is fading. Okay. It means he's, 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 he's seriously ill. So Ananda, remember Ananda then teaches him the Dharma, he says, Householder, when an uneducated, ordinary person has four things, they are frightened and terrified and fear what awaits them after death. What for? So he says, an uneducated, ordinary person distrusts the Buddha, distrusts the Dharma, distrusts the Sangha, and has unethical conduct, meaning conduct that is not in accordance with the five precepts. So, Seeing this in themselves, they are frightened and terrified and fear what awaits them after death. So usually someone like this, um, how you say, if they're at this point, you can safely say that they haven't really explored the Buddha's teachings. So because of their ignorance, they don't know uh, the process of death and they don't know what awaits them. And naturally, they, um, they, uh, fear arises and also because they have not led a virtuous life um, that uh, at this point in their lives uh, the fear is, is kind of compounded okay then remember another continues it says when an educated noble disciple has four things they don't become frightened of terrif or, or terrified about their death so what are the four things they have experiential confidence in the Buddha so what is experiential? Uh, I hope I'm saying that. 
uh, pronouncing that correctly, ex exper experiential confidence. Uh, it means that it's not blind confidence that you have, you know, it, uh, but a confidence born out of um, uh, uh, experience and result. So for example, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, say, let's, let's talk about the Sangha by, um, by surrounding yourself with the Sangha, you observe the conduct of the Sangha and you emulate their example and you realize that it makes a positive difference in your life. So you find out for yourself that, oh, if I do certain things like how the Sangha does, my life does improve. Uh, you follow the teachings of the Buddha, you put it into practice and you see for yourself uh, the difference it makes in your own life. So that's exper experiential confidence. Regular confidence is you believe, but you haven't, um, like say you believe meditation is good, but you never meditated before and you don't know how it feels like or what benefit it can bring. So that's the difference between experiential and and just regular confidence. And number four is uh, they follow the precepts. They have ethical conduct, love and praise by the noble ones. So Venerable Ananda explains that if you have these four things, then you won't fear what uh, you won't fear death or what comes after death. So Anatta Pindika uh, replies says, Sir Ananda, I'm not afraid. What do I have to fear? For I have experiential confidence in the Buddha, the teaching, the Sangha, and of the training rules appropriate for lay people taught by the Buddha. I don't see any that I have broken. So it is said that at this point, um, Anatta Pindika became a first stage arhat, a stream enterer. And remember Ananda could see that. And so he kind of certified him and says, you're a fortunate householder, so very fortunate, you have declared the fruit of stream entry. And that's kind of important for lay people uh, because uh, lay people, okay, everyone, okay, anyone has the opportunity to become a first stage arhat. You can become a sage, just like the, um, there's a, there was a very famous monk in Taiwan that only ate fruits. Uh, people call him the fruit monk. And oh, there's a very interesting story about that monk. Uh, Shifu, went to Taiwan and Shofu paid him a visit and Shofu introduced the two monks who were doing three steps, one bow. I think this was maybe from the first three steps, one bow, uh, which was uh, Heng Shou and Dharma Master uh, Heng, I don't remember their names, but this was the, I think this was, it could be this, the second three steps, one bow, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, when uh, Shofu introduced the monks to um, the fruit monk, as he's commonly called. And I call him that because I don't remember his his uh, uh, monk name. He said, oh, I know. I've seen them before when I was flying past uh, the US. <laughs> so apparently as a first stage arhat, or maybe uh, for him, he could, he had spiritual powers and he could fly around. So he already saw them doing their three steps, uh, one bow of pilgrimage. So, so it's not, only monks who can become first stage arhats is everyone who practices, but you have to have, okay, experiential confidence. Okay, let me go back one slide. You have to have these four factors. These, are, these four factors are what are known as the four factors for stream and um, stream entry, uh, uh, to be a stream enterer, okay? That means you your confidence is the Buddha and the Buddha comes from uh, actual confidence okay uh, in the Dharma in the Sangha in the teachings and in the community and you have to follow the precepts okay this four are the prerequisite forms the foundation for one to become a, uh, a first stage all right okay all right so that's the story of Okay, that's the first half of Anatta Pindika. And it is uh, said that he fell sick again. So he, he, he became well. Uh, he was taught that as a first stage arhat, if you concentrate well enough, you can overcome your sickness. And he did that. But a third time he fell sick. And this time was kind of like 
the the uh, the real end of his life. And so again, he asked uh, Venerable Ananda and Venerable Sariputra to come pay pay him a visit. So when Venerable Sariputra saw him this time, he knew that An An Anatta Pindika was nearing death. So uh, he asked Anatta Pindika, "How are you?" And the reply was, "I'm not keeping well, Master Sariputra. I'm not all right. The pain is terrible and growing." The winds piercing my head are so severe, it feels like a strong man drilling into my head with a sharp point. The pain in my head is so severe, it feels like a strong man tightening a tough leather strap around my head. The winds slicing my belly are so severe, like a deaf butcher or the apprentice were slicing open a cow's belly with a meat cleaver. The burning in my body is so severe, it feels like two strong men grabbing a weaker man by the arms to burn and scorch him on a pit of glowing coals. So he's being very, very descriptive. In other words, he's truly suffering. The, the illness that he's undergoing uh, is no joke. Okay, so the, the sutra carries on. Uh, I'm taking this part from a different uh, sutra from the Maha... Mahaji Nikaya uh, number 143 if anyone is interested in reading it themselves. So he said Shariputra knew that Ananda Pindika was nearing death and gave him the following instructions. He said, do not cling householder to the six sense faculties and do not attach your thoughts to them. And then he said, do not cling to the six sense objects and do not attach your thoughts to them. And he said, do not cling to the six types of consciousness to the six sense contacts and to the six feelings. Okay, so this is uh, a slightly more advanced uh, form of contemplation. Um, and uh, so if you can't really follow along, it's okay. Um, you can just listen. If you have any questions, uh, please ask. And I'll just explain what's going on here. Basically, what uh, Venerable Shatrip Putra is referring to is what is known as the 18 realms. What are the 18 realms? Okay. The 18 realms is made up of the six sense faculties, the six sense objects, and the six consciousnesses. So what are the six sense faculties? Well, look at your face, all right? It's the eyes. Okay, you can't look at your face unless you have a mirror. But be aware of your face, okay? Your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue and then your body, your entire body, and your mind. Those make up the six sense faculties. All right. What are the six sense objects? Well, what do your eyes see? Your eyes see sights or forms. What do your ears do? They hear sounds. Your nose smells, smells. So the six sense objects, sight, sound, smells, taste, taste, excuse me, touch because of the body, your body touch things, and thoughts that come from the mind. So you have the six sense faculties, and then when they meet their six sense objects, it is said that the six consciousnesses will arise. So the six consciousnesses are the eye consciousness, the ear consciousness, the nose, tongue, body, and the mind consciousness will arise. So you get three six, three times six, you get 18. All right. So Basically, what Chariputra is saying is, when it comes to your eyes, it says, do not cling to the eye. Don't get attached to the eye. And don't get settled in the eye consciousness. When it comes to sights that the eye see, don't cling to what you see. And don't get settled in the things that you see. So that's the instructions Shariputra is giving to Anatta Pindika. Why? Because Anatta Pindika um, his faculties, his body is giving him a lot of affliction right now. So uh, Shariputra is giving him a way out of the suffering. What do normal people do when we fall sick? Uh, we, we, we don't really have a choice. We turn towards medicine, but we don't really turn to our minds to try to find a way out. We turn towards external sources, but we don't train ourselves to turn within, to turn inward, to discover the strength of our mind. So this is what Shariputra is doing 
to Anatta Pindika based on his description of how much he's suffering. That means he's very much uh, in tune with, uh, how you say, uh, the suffering of his body. He's looking outwards. So Mirabha Shariputra is saying, okay, now you try to look inwards. And as you look inwards, don't settle on these things. Don't get attached to these things. Look past them. Okay, ignore them. So you have the six sense faculties, six sense objects, the six types of consciousness, and then you have the six contexts. What are the six contexts? It just means that when your eyes see something, there's a contact there. All right. The, when your uh, ears hear a sound, there's a moment of contact. And then he says the six feelings. What are the six feelings? What results from you seeing something? When you see something nice, you like it, that's a feeling. You see something you don't like or you smell something you don't like, that's a feeling as well. So he says that as a result of your eyes and seeing things and your consciousness arises, after that comes uh, uh, feelings. Don't pay attention to those feelings as well. Okay. Then Shariputra goes on to say, do not cling to the six elements, do not cling to the five aggregates, do not cling to the four formless realms. Okay, what are the six elements? The six elements are earth or matter, that means our form, anything solid, and then water, fire, air, space, and consciousness makes up the six elements. What are the five aggregates? The five aggregates are also known as the five skandhas. Um, it is basically another way of understanding the uh, the six the six senses, which is the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. In other words, our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind, body and mind, and our five skandhas, or the five skandhas, is our way of experiencing the world around us. Okay, that's another way of understanding our senses. Or when you come across the term, the five aggregates or the five skandhas, it means how we interact with the world around us. So for example, a scientist, when they measure, say, the universe, they measure the planets and all that, they have telescopes and they have different instruments that measure different uh, uh, wavelengths of light, infrared, and, and all those things. And now they just send a new telescope called the what? The James Webb Telescope. Previously, we had the Hubble. Now we have a better, newer, shinier, more advanced telescope called the James Webb Telescope uh, that can gather in more information. So they discover more things. So for a scientist uh, in that field, what astronomy, I guess, what field is that? Uh, they rely on their instruments to learn about the world around us. So we as human beings, as we interface with the world, as we measure our own world, as we figure out what, what is our world, we do it through our senses or our five skandhas. That's another way to understand what the five skandhas are. Okay. And then what are the four formless realms? The four formless realms is the sphere or space, the sphere of consciousness, the sphere of nothingness, and the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. Basically, this is, uh, you could say this are uh, the most advanced uh, meditation. I wouldn't say advanced. Uh, okay, when your mind gets very still, uh, you can enter any of these four concentrations. Um, uh, known as the uh, sphere of space, consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. So, Mirabal Shariputra is telling Anatta Pindika not to get attached to any of this. Okay. Why? Okay. We're going to find out why. Next, Mirabal Shariputra says, tells Anatta Pindika, he says, I shall not grasp this world and there shall be no consciousness of mind dependent on this world. I shall not grasp the other world and there shall be no consciousness of mind dependent on the other world. I shall not grasp whatever is seen, heard, thought, known, sought, and explored by my mind, and there shall be no consciousness of mind dependent on that. So basically everything that we just read, the last few slides, can be 
kind of like summarize in the last line that we just read. All those different ways of explaining like the 18 realms, the, the six uh, senses that we have, the five skandhas, um, all those are explaining the different ways that of, no, let me, I don't want to say it wrongly. Um, the, you could say that those are the different states of existence that are available to Anatta Pindika. In other words, if he was to get attached to any of them, then he would still be uh, caught in the world in, in samsara within birth and death. So what Shariputra is trying to explain to uh, Anatta Pindika is that ignore all this. Uh, the five skandhas are known as a uh, thief. We mistake the five skandhas for the self. We think that the five skandhas are us, which is a wrong view. So he's trying to guide Anatta Pindika away from a wrong view through these instructions. If these instructions don't make sense to you, it is totally fine. Um, I just thought I would include it because for some of you, it might, it might make some sense and it might inspire some of you to further study uh, in this area. Why? Okay, well, because when Anatta Pindika heard this teaching, he cried. He cried loudly and tears streamed down. So Venerable Ananda uh, was a bit concerned. He said, are you failing householder? Are you fading? That means are you dying and you know, you don't really understand what we are trying to tell you. Like maybe some of us, we don't understand the, the, what we just read. And then uh, Anatta Pindika replied, he said, good sir Ananda, not that I stick fast or sing, but for a long time, I have paid homage to the Buddha and the esteemed mendicants yet. I have never before heard such a Dharma talk. Okay. So then variable Shariputra, uh, like some of you, you may not heard this kind of, uh, uh, teaching before, or you may have heard, but you don't really understand what's going on. So then variable Shariputra explained to Anatta Mindika, he said, well, this type of teaching are usually reserved for monks because, um, the monk's job is to look within and train their mind. And so it's not taught to lay people because lay people usually don't have time to sit down and meditate and, and observe their mind in that way. Um, then Anatta Pindika said, no, no, no. Uh, the, just as how he has benefited from hearing this Dharma talk, there will be many more who, uh, many more lay people who uh, will be able to benefit. So although he was the chief patron of the Buddha, and he every day provided alms to, to uh, the Buddha's uh, monks and he hosted the Buddha many times and listened to the Buddha speak Dharma. He never heard that kind of Dharma before. Or you could say that maybe he had, but the conditions were not right for him to be able to, for the Dharma to become experiential uh, confidence, meaning Maybe because he was dying, listening to that kind of Dharma at that, at that point in time, uh, he could relate. He, he, he found a way out from the suffering of his body, basically. Okay. So next, when the venerable Sariputra and Ananda had given the householder Anatta Pindika this advice, they got up from their seat and left. Not long after they left, Anatta Pindika passed away. And guess what? He was reborn in the host of joyful gods, otherwise known as a Toshita heaven. And I think he was, I'm willing to bet that he's, he was born in the inner court of the Toshita heaven. So what happened later? Late at night, the glorious god Anatta Pindika, the newly uh, born god of the Toshita heaven, lighting up the entire Cheta grove. He ran up to the Buddha or rather he came down from the heaven to the Buddha, he bowed, stood to one side and addressed the Buddha in verse. So he said, this is indeed the, that Jetta grove frequented by the Sangha of hermits, where the king of Dharma state, it brings me joy. Well, of course he brings him joy. I mean, that's the, that was his gift to the Buddha, the Jetta grove. He says, deeds, knowledge and principle, ethical conduct and excellent lifehood. By these are mortals purified, 
not by clan or wealth. That's why an astute person, seeing what's good for themselves, would examine the teaching rationally and thus be purified in it. Shariputra has true wisdom, ethics, and also peace. So he's um, showing his gratitude to, to Venerable Shariputra. And the mendicant who has crossed over can at best equal him. So he's saying Shari, Venerable Shariputra has no peer. He's, he's one of the best. Um, so that's the story of Anatta Pendika, the Buddha's uh, chief patron. Okay, so uh, let me see. Saha is on with us. Okay, we are right towards the end. I promise uh, Saha a story. Uh, but before that, let me see. Mm. Okay, and I'll keep the rest for later. Next week, what we're going to do uh, is we are going to explore the Buddha, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, before he became the Buddha in his past life, how he got to the Tushita heaven, and um, how from the Tushita heaven, the, the things that happened for him to come down to Jambu Vipa and be reborn. And uh, it's very, uh, how you say, um, a lot of things going on that are, that are very fun, fun to find out. Yeah. Okay, so Saha, uh, the story that I promised you a few weeks ago uh, is some is a story that I've told before. Um, it involves uh, Phil. Phil is some is a resident of City TB, City of Ten Thousand Buddhas, and I think Phil might be like almost ninety now. Um, so anyway, Phil told me this story, and he gave me permission to share it because it's a wonderful story. Um, Phil told me that when he was growing up, his relationship with his mother uh, was not a healthy one. It was not good. He remembers, for example, uh, he said when he was very young, um, he said whenever a, a plane would fly over their house, and this was because Phil is, I think, close to 90. He's like in, at least in his 80s now. He said whenever an aeroplane would fly over their house, he would hear the sound of the aeroplane and he would remember that the television would, the, the picture on the television would, would uh, be affected. And he says he remembers that his mother would punish him whenever that happened. And he felt that it was very unfair. So uh, he just told me that one little story to, to kind of give me context on why his relationship with his mother uh, wasn't smooth. And so he said a few years back, he, so Phil is a meditator, he meditates and sometimes when he meditates, he can recall his past, uh, short snippets of his past lives. So he said one day when he was meditating, he said suddenly he had this vision, uh, he was looking up from the sky, looking down, and it was kind of like an old English town, and it was maybe like the 1800s before electricity, he said that he could see people uh, he said it was it was uh, coming to nighttime. It was evening, and people were lighting the street lamps. Uh, the street lamps were made of had oil, so uh, he, he could see someone walking from street lamp to street lamp, and with a pole light the um, the light. Yeah, the lamp, the, the street lamp, and so he said his vision then came to this house, and he saw. Uh, it was, I think he said it was during winter, it was very cold. He said he saw a very young uh, woman carrying a baby walk up to this house and knock on the door. And when the door opened, he said an old man uh, answered the door and he instantly recognized the man as himself in his past life. And he said at that moment, he remembered that he was a very famous composer. So it was someone who had status as a very famous composer. And he saw this old man look at the, 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 the woman carrying the baby, a newborn baby. And what this old man did was he slammed the door shut in, in the girl's face. And the girl looking very, very dejected, turned around and walked away. And he said he remember that uh, this girl was his daughter and who had a baby out of, uh, what, what's the term for it, out of wedlock. And he uh, disowned his own daughter because 
he felt that his reputation was more important. So at that time, apparently, you know, if you're, um, it's taboo to, to have a baby if you're not married. So as a famous composer, he had status and he wanted to preserve that status. And so he disowned his daughter. And at that moment, he realized that his mother in this, this present life was that girl. The girl that he turned away, his own daughter, was now his mother in this present life. So he said the first thing he did after that was he called his mother and, and apologized. And the mother said, why are you apologizing for? He said, oh, you know, uh, for something I might have done. And uh, he said it was good that his mother was still around. Uh, the mother was in a care home, I think in Florida. So he, he still had the opportunity to fly down to Florida and spend time with his mother. And when his mother was sick, he could care for his mother. So he related that story to me. Yeah. So sometimes things happen to us. We don't really know why it may seem really unfair. Uh, but when it comes to cause and effect, nothing happens by chance. The only way, uh, Shufu says that if, uh, how do you say, we kind of deserve everything that happens to us. We may not remember and it's not our, f you can say it's not our fault. So we can't judge other people for the things that they have to undergo. But cause and effect teaches us to, to accept what we have done and not to add more animosity or to further the, the unhealthy cycle of, of, of back and forth of unwholesomeness. All right. Okay. Any questions? If not, um, uh, I know someone has requested for a copy of that sutra. I'll share it in the, in our WhatsApp group. For now, let me end this slideshow and get the dedication of merit up. Okay, so I'm going to invite everyone to put our palms together and get married. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see, our hands and hearts can find in giving unity. May our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Okay, let's do three bows to the Buddha. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Half bow. Bowing respect to the Venerable Master. Second bow. Third bow. Half bow. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Amitofo. Amitofo.